The next presenter we have for you this morning is, um, is Craig Adams from, uh, from Merino, New Zealand. So, so if we open our Ag Innovation booklets to page 10, we can, um, we can read all about Craig. It's got a biography about him there. So I'm, I'm not going to tell you about that, but what some of you may realise, but possibly most of you won't, is that Craig is also uh, a country music singer of, of, of some note in New Zealand. So, um, so, so we did think about filling the space this morning with, his, um, with a song or two, but he hasn't got his guitar and he said most musicians don't start before, um, before midday and without any alcohol in the system. But look, um, Craig is currently touring his second and latest album. Um, it's called the Yesterday's Today Tour. Uh, Pori Ruhr on the 21st, Gisborne on the 27th, Hawke's Bay on the 28th. That follows on from his debut album, Country High. So, um, so Craig's got a cool day job, possibly even cooler night job. So, but we're going to hear about his day job today. And if you like the sound of that, then maybe you can catch his album or, or him on tour. So now I'd like to invite Craig Adams up onto the stage to talk about Merino, New Zealand. Plug. I didn't expect that, but he's quite right. I'm not used to standing on the stage at this hour of the morning when the audience uh, is completely sober, um, <laughs> without any alcohol in them, and certainly not without my guitar. Te hei Māori ora, te whare etu nei, te nā koe, te pape e wāho nei, te nā koe, e rauranga tira mā, te nā koutou, te hunga mā te, ki te hunga mā te, haere, 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 te hunga ora, ki a tātou, te hunga ora, te nā koutou, te nā koutou, Tēnā koutou katoa. Good morning everyone. Um, as Will introduced me, I am Craig Adams. I'm from the New Zealand Merino Company. I was fortunate a couple of years ago to go up to, uh, uh, to San Francisco and spend a week or so with a company called IDEO up there. I don't know, many of you may have heard of IDEO. IDEO are an innovation and design company based in Palo Alto in, the, in Silicon Valley. And they specialise in, in obviously design and innovation. And they, they um, they helped me really think about innovation and change the way I, th the way I think about, about innovation. So I'd like to start um, a, with a, a little video just to set the scene. Here goes my uh, new technology. Good technology. I mean, you can use your finger like that. You don't even need a clicker. <laughs> Innovation changes. It was really cool listening to Dan's um, presentation um, just before me. It, it's great because it segues quite nicely into what I what I want to talk about. There's a lot of synergies and, and things in there, and it was great to see him talking about Alpine Origin Merino, uh, a joint venture that the New Zealand Merino Company has with Silver Fern Farms, selling uh, differentiated uh, meat into markets around the world like, like the USA. So to begin with, um, my, my brief today is to talk about the New Zealand Merino Company and the New Zealand Merino Company story. So to, to start with, I'd like to paint a picture, if you like. And my picture is of the wool industry back in the 1950s, if you like. Back in the 1950s, World War II's um, been gone now for uh, five or six years. 
uh, the population growth around the world is increasing quite significantly. US economy is booming. Many of the economies around the world are booming. It's looking like a great place to live um, and a great place to thrive and a great place to, bleed, uh, to breed, in, uh, which Dan just talked about. He was uh, one of those baby boomers that was coming along through that, through that 19, 1950s. At that stage, population growth was expected to double between 1950, or around about double between 1950 and 1970. There was a wool boom on. Um, prices for wool had, had uh, all-time record highs in, in the 1950s, and things looked things look pretty good. There was an attraction towards more fashion. Um, as, as we got forward into the 1950s and, and uh, more, more social uh, advertising and things coming through with TV and that, there was an opportunity around, around fashion. And we were excused for believing, look, no worries, we're going to be rich, particularly in the wool industry. And I'll give you an example. One of our high country stations in the South Island, an iconic station, was bought in the early 1950s. Now, just after they bought that property, they went out and uh, did a straggle muster around this big high country station and they rust, uh, rounded up all those sheep. And the story goes that they shore those sheep and from that straggle muster, they sold the wool and the wool check paid the mortgage on the high country station um, after they sold that wool in, in the early 1950s during the wool boom of, uh, uh, that, that was involved in the, in the Korean War. So I guess I'm painting the picture that at that stage things look pretty rosy and I guess there's some uh, synergies around some of the other industries that we see in New Zealand. I guess the, the, the obvious one is the dairy industry at the moment. There, things, things were looking really, really rosy, but we sat back and we didn't do a hell of a lot. And if we jump forward to where we are now, things have changed pretty quickly because what we see in commodities, well, I'm telling you stuff that you already know, generally when we see a commodity boom like that, it's followed by a significant... Bust. Bust, correct. <laughs> Uh, absolutely, um, followed by a significant bust. So if we skip forward to, to kind of where we are now, I borrowed these numbers off beef and lamb actually, um, but uh, 3,490, just to put some perspective around it, the number of sheep per day lost to the New Zealand wool industry since 1990. Pretty sobering, and if you click on to the next uh, slide, that refers to around about 18 and a half tonnes of wool a day lost to the industry since 1990. So if we're thinking about where we were in 1950, things were looking pretty rosy to where we are now, you know that, there, that uh, we've got some issues. In fact, um, I, I'll make the observation, um, it's not a criticism, it's an observation, but the wool industry is pretty much on its knees. Uh, many of the farmers in the room will know that it's, at, at times recently it's cost more to share the sheep than the value of the wool that's been sold in, in the marketplace. And it was really great to see Dan setting the scene for, for what I'm going to talk about today, uh, the importance in connecting with your consumers and understanding your consumers and understanding the markets that we, that we need to target. We need to shift away from producing a product that we think is right for the market and then saying, how much are you going to pay us for that, for that product? We need to connect with those markets, connect with those consumers and produce something that the market wants and the market needs. What we're saying, and I don't think it's just the, the wool industry here, I think that we can talk about the New Zealand primary sector, and I'll talk a lot about collaboration today in, in uh, what we're doing with the New Zealand Merino Company. It's not what we're selling it, but it's how we're selling it. And we think there's an opportunity and, a, and, and revenue lost there that we need to be taking a hold of. We think New Zealand's hugely vulnerable. The solution to the problems that we face requires a seismic shift in business and attitudes. And I'm not just talking about the wool growers here, I'm talking about the manufacturers, I'm talking about the wool growers, I'm talking about us as marketers, and I'm talking about the consumers that we want to connect with. We need to understand the way they think and we need to connect with them and help them think about our products. You know, I was talking to um, one of the gentlemen that's speaking here this afternoon, a farmer from Riversdale, uh, Russell, I think his name was, we were talking downstairs this morning before we started about the fact that if you went to a carpet shop in, in, uh, in Palmerston North today to buy a carpet for your new home that you're building, I can pretty much guarantee that they'll try and sell you the synthetic carpet. Um, and, and, that's, and, that's, and that's the fact. That we, need to cons we need to connect with those consumers and tell those stories. They'll tell you that that synthetic carpet will, won't fade. It's non-flammable it won't stain and we can get the stains off it. Uh, it won't give you a, an electric shock when you walk across it and, and create static electricity. Bloody wool does the same stuff. It always has done the same stuff, but we haven't connected and we haven't told those stories. We haven't made that information available to our consumers to go out there and do that. And I think there's an opportunity, well I know that there's an opportunity for us to do that. So when I say a solution requires a seismic shift in business and attitude, that's right across. That's from us 
from on-farm to our marketing teams to the branding teams that we're working with, the manufacturers, and out to our consumers uh, overseas in the market. The New Zealand Merino Company is starting to bring it back down about us is about market shape and reform, and it's very much about how Dan talked about before, is connecting you as farmers or the farmers within the room with the market at the other end. The old model, the way that we used to work, and the wool industry is synonymous with it, and I've worked in the industry all my life, um, so I, I was part of that, that uh, that conspiracy, if you like, was to keep farmers as far away from the market as possible. It was about having our brands and our market over here and our farmers over here. Our model is very much about aligning that and bringing that together. Connecting you with the brand, connecting you with the market, and you understanding that market and understanding that brand, and vice versa, those brands and that market understanding your business on farm and the, and the difficulties that you face and the challenge points that we meet throughout, throughout the way. But together, again, connecting with the consumers and finding empathy from our consumers and how we can target those consumers going forward. So to bring it back down, what I, what I was asked to speak about is obviously the New Zealand Merino story. The New Zealand Merino Company was formed around about 20 years ago as, as, as Merino New Zealand, which was a breakaway from the war board. A group of farmers got together, innovative farmers, I guess, and, and it's, it's in our DNA in New Zealand, I guess, to be innovators, in particular our farmers, with our number eight wire and, and our, our ability to get the job done. These farmers got together and said, we want to differentiate Merino wool away from um, just wool per se in New Zealand, we want to do something different with our, with our product. To do that, they needed to get a movement going. They needed to get a group of people going in the same direction and thinking the same way. And I guess that's kind of where we're at here in New Zealand at the moment with this changing attitude towards how we approach selling our products in the marketplace. New Zealand Merino Company has a, a close relationship with Stanford University, and I'll elaborate on that a little bit more as we go forward. But one of the professors that we have worked with up there is, a, a, is a Dr. Bergelman, and he talks about what the New Zealand Merino Company farmers did in doing what, uh, in achieving New Zealand Merino as making things happen that don't happen naturally. And that's, that's his take on leadership, I guess. If this was going to happen, it would have happened a long time ago. So it was actually shifting the thinking and changing something um, to, to uh, completely new to what we were doing. So that was about shifting from that traditional commodity market of price taking to a much more market shaping environment. Um, and to do that, it's, it's, it takes a lot, a lot more sophistication, a, lot, uh, a higher level of sophistication and technology and experience, and it's a lot more difficult to do. So it was taking not only the growers and shifting the growers thinking from that price taking mentality to a more market shaping mentality, but it was going out and finding those partners and finding opportunities out in the marketplace to achieve, to achieve that goal. It's much more complex, it's much more sophisticated, and it takes a lot more resource uh, to do that. So where we were uh, back in, uh, say, 15 years ago when the New Zealand Merino Company was formed, pretty much all of the fine wool, so all of the Merino wool in New Zealand was sold at auction, much like crossbred wool is, is today. I was an auctioneer, um, and that's the way we transacted our wool. You as farmers would send your wool into the wool store, uh, we'd give you the, the wool test results, talk a little bit about what we thought the market was going to do, give you some valuations, and then sell it in the auction and we'd lose all track of that completely. It was also said that New Zealand Merino wool couldn't be uh, used or, or processed on its own. It had to be blended with Australian wool or South African wool because it wasn't good enough. The attributes weren't good enough um, for it to be processed on, on its own. What an absolute load of rubbish. And we were sold that for a, for a, long, a long period of time. Now you've got brands such as Icebreaker, um, um, smart wool designer textiles that have got 100% New Zealand Merino garments out there in the marketplace that are really performing, performing well. We still have some wool that's sold through auction in Melbourne that we don't have through our full supply um, branded contracts. And I can assure you that when I'm auctioneering in Melbourne, the Australian buyers now are buying um, poorer style, poorer type New Zealand Merino wool to blend it with Australian wool to lift the value and lift the uh, processing capabilities of those Australian, Australian types. So really interesting, breaking down those myths and those traditions that we've been uh, been led to believe over a long period of time and, and, and changing that, that field of space. If you move forward, please. To where we are now, 15 years later, the likes of uh, this, sh this shot here shows a pair of uh, Icebreaker socks now. So Icebreaker's been running in conjunction with the New Zealand Merino Company for about, uh, for about 15 years. It started off as 
half a dozen bales of wool on the back of a trailer out of the McKenzie country, an, an idea, an, an innovative idea by, by a few people. It's now in excess of a thousand tonnes of wool of year going into Icebreaker um, and, and marketed at, uh, to markets all around the world. The relationship is with the growers that are growing that wool and with Icebreaker directly. Jeremy Moon and, um, and Rob Fife now have a direct relationship with the growers that are supplying the wool for those contracts. They've been involved in those contracts for, for 15 years. They've been supplying those contracts through the highs and the lows. And what we've endeavoured to do and what the New Zealand Merino growers were adamant they wanted to do was take out that volatility uh, from their from their product from their selling through that commodity market, through the auction system. And that volatility, we believe, kills markets. It kills markets from our brand's perspective, from the likes of Icebreaker, but it also kills it for, for you. And, and, a, and I guess those figures that I put up before from Beef and Lamb showing the drop declining sheep numbers are an example of you can't afford having your price of, of wool or, or, or lamb or whatever one year being being up here and then six months later or a year later it's, it's dropped down there. We're not about trying to hit the very top price all the time and we're not a, uh, trying to have the very low price all the time, what we're trying to do is find a sustainable price for our, for our brand partner at one end and a sustainable price for our grower at the other end that enables you as, as farmers to invest in your property, invest in, in what you're doing and in your business, and it enables our brand partner at the other end to grow. Our philosophy has been driven by our, our, our wool growers, so just to understand the, the, the structure and the makeup of the New Zealand Merino Company, uh, we, we went commercial um, uh, quite a few years ago now. I shifted from Merino New Zealand, which is a compulsory levy funded organisation now to a standalone commercial company. Um, and we were a 50-50 joint venture with uh, Merino Growers, owned 50% of the company and PGG Wrightson's owned the other 50%. And in recent, and probably five or so years ago, the Merino Growers bought out PGG Wrightson's, now we're a standalone commercial company that's owned by uh, Merino Growers Investments Limited. The strategy for our business has been to partner narrow and, and deep, much like uh, Dan talked about before, connecting with brands in the marketplace and having narrow and deep relationships with those brands. It's identifying those key brands in the marketplace that we want to partner with. We don't want to partner with everybody. We can't partner with everybody. We want to select the best ones and have relationships relationships with them. And I've put some of those examples up there for you to have a look at in terms of the Merino um, business and, and where we've established from. And it's really quite interesting and I'll sort of elaborate on this whole area around innovation and how that's grown over that period of time. But if you look up in the top left there, the love heart on the side, that's a company uh, called called Smartwool. Um, really interesting. Smartwool is a hosiery company that makes, makes socks. They started off making ski socks, now they've moved into apparel. Um, really exciting. I'll just show you something that I think is pretty cool. I, I don't know why I picked this up, but I think it's a lot more interesting than a pair of socks, but they're now into apparel. This is a, uh, this is a sports bra that, um, that, Smart Wool, that Smart Wool have made to show you the type of innovation that have come from just making socks. Um, and I'll talk about some of the attribute work and things that we work on with them to help them sell their products in the marketplace. Um, which is really exciting, and then you've got your traditional. Then you've got your traditional markets that we first established, which was around that uh, woven fabrics for Italian suiting that was synonymous with with New Zealand merino walls and Australian merino walls back in the day. The likes of Raider there that we see underneath Smart Wall, the second one down on your uh, left hand side, and incidentally, just in the last 48 hours, we've signed a new five year supply contract with Raider going forward for our fine wool growers down in the South Island. That takes 15 and a half, 16 and a half, 17 and a half, and 18 and a half micron in that really top end, um, supplying the Italian weaving market through to Raider. That relationship's developed over a, a long period of time. So, so really exciting. And then obviously on the right hand side, on the other side, Icebreaker, key, um, iconic Kiwi brand now that's developed in conjunction with the New Zealand Merino Company as the New Zealand Merino Company's grown, Icebreaker's grown as well, and Icebreaker it probably doesn't need a lot of talk. I see a lot of um, Icebreaker garments around around the room here, which is which is really exciting. Key, key other brands like uh, Laura Piana down the bottom there. Laura Piana is a high fashion uh, European brand that's just been sold to Louis Vuitton for something like four billion dollars, I think it was. So. Um, you know, talking, talking really big money. But the interesting thing about the likes of Laura Piana is that PG Laura Piana, the owner of the, of the company, has been down here to New Zealand and visited with the farmers on farm many, 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 many times. That's how important, um, to Dan's point, the relationship of the supply with the wool growers here in New Zealand is to their markets 
uh, that they're trying to connect with and their consumers that they're connecting with and selling overseas. Uh, I can't emphasize that enough how important it is and how it's a key part of the way we do business is connecting you as farmers with those markets out the other end and having a relationship with those, with those markets. So what we're actually trying to do is shift away from that commodity transaction to a much more experienced transaction. How can we, how can we connect with those consumers that are buying those garments, that are paying 5,000 euros for that Italian suit, or paying you know, $200 for that icebreaker top when they could buy the same sort of synthetic type top um, uh, made out of oil for a third, a third of the price. Why, why are those consumers prepared to pay that money and how can we leverage that money and, and leverage that funding back to you as, as growers on farm? And that's, that's much more through experience, marketing um, and connection with our consumers than the old way of taking your wool to the auction and putting the hammer down and then wondering where it's going. So every day when we get up, our, our CEO, uh, uh, John Brackenridge, is emphasising to us how important it is for us to add value to our brand partners, our, our market partners in the marketplace, the, uh, you know, uh, the likes of, of Dan and, and, the, uh, and his connection back to us. And that's through sales, reputation and margin. Again, it reflects back directly to you on farm because if without you and if it's not sustainable for the farmers on farm, then uh, our brand partners in the market don't have a, have a business. But likewise, if they don't have the supply coming out of New Zealand and it's not sustainable here in New Zealand, uh, their business doesn't work as well. So the more value we can create for our, our connected brand partners in the marketplace, the more products they can sell but at the higher price they can sell, the more uh, we can get our merino products uh, in front of people and connecting with consumers, the, the more value we can generate back to you on farm. We can't ask for more money for you as farmers without providing value um, to those products and adding value to those products for our brand partners. Um, it, it's, it's obviously pretty fundamental. So key to that is aligning the value chain. It, you know, if you, look at, um, if you look at the wool industry, but you look at the meat industry and, 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 and a lot of others, the value chain is important. We can't cut people out of that value chain. We need to have them in that value chain. The current model for, for say, crossbred wool or the model that was for merino wool 15 odd years ago was very fractured. Um, basically, and, and it's not a criticism, again, it's just an observation, it worked for our fathers and it worked for our grandfathers, but what got us to here isn't going to get us to there. The world's changing and it's changing at a fast rate of knots and we need to change with it. So this model of, of combative um, structure in the supply chain doesn't work. Basically, for want of a better word, the supply chain's about screwing each other for margin as hard as we can throughout the supply chain. I'm trying to buy your wool the cheapest I possibly can, but still keep you happy so that you'll come back and sell it to me next year. I'm trying to sell it on to the top maker here. He's trying to screw me as hard as he can for the, the, for the uh, price of the wool and so on and so forth out to the other end. And basically, in all fairness, it's the grower, it's the farmer, it's the producer where the buck stops. It's the producer, I'm not telling you something that you don't know, but it's the producer that gets hit the hardest in that supply chain. <coughs> So the key thing for us was aligning the value chain in the merino business, for example, um, and I've, I've got this up here to show you a, 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 an example of, say, the icebreaker supply chain. The key thing that I want to point out is that the two ends of the value chain there you've got, and I'm not talking about the manufacturer either, I'm not talking about selling to a top maker or a processor, I'm talking about the link with the brand, the link with the consumer at retail, and the other pole of power at the other end is the farmer. And I've, I've deliberately put the farmer at this end because, again, as I say, it's got to be sustainable at both ends, but the key to this, if it's not sustainable for the farmer, the whole model doesn't work. There needs to be transparency throughout the supply chain. We need to be able to sell our story into a brand, connect with a brand, understand their consumers, work with them to get empathy for their consumers into who they're, contact, uh, who they're targeting to sell to. We need to understand that, we need to bring that back through the supply chain and, and prepare the product from the farmer's point of view to hit those markets and target those markets and get the best value for the, produ uh, for the produce that you're producing on farm. Now once we establish that relationship with the brand at the other end, that's only the first step, then it's to get back through that supply chain because the mentality through the supply chain has been that tra uh, trading mentality over 200 years. So it is difficult, but it can be done. And Icebreak is a, an example of, of that, and Smart Wool is an example of that, and Laura Piana is an example of that. The efficiencies then come because all the way through those uh, supply chain, there are, there are um, points where 
there are um, collisions, if you like, there are tough points um, around pricing. But if we can establish a sustainable price with our brand partner at the far end, and sustainable with our far, uh, farmer at this end, and then work their, through that supply chain so that everybody's having a share in that, everybody's business is making some money, everybody can invest in that, that understand the philosophy behind what we're trying to achieve, then we will achieve it. But we, we have to have transparency through that supply chain and we have to have buy-in through that su supply chain and it can and it can be done. Um, what then it does then is opens up the opportunity then to start getting some production efficiencies um, throughout the supply chain. If the top maker knows the product that he's producing and the market that he's producing it for, there's opportunities around production efficiencies for him, which is cost savings for him, which is, has been a, a perfect example in the likes of Icebreaker. On farm for the likes of Icebreaker, when we first started off, we were preparing all the merino wool that was being grown, was being prepared as though it was going to the semi-worsted um, system for the Italian weavers um, to produce a garment like those Laura Piana uh, suits that I talked about before. Now to do that, it takes double skirting, it takes, you've got to take the backs out, the necks out, and basically you're left with about 35% of the fleece that's capable of going into those, those suiting markets. That's just the nature of preparation that's required for those Italian weavers. It's very, very, very tight specifications. We used to prepare all the merino wool that was going to auction in that sense, because that's all we knew. And then we gave opportunity for others to put those back together in their parcels that they were delivering later on and make a margin on those. And we lost out on that, you lost out on that as farmers. As we started working with brands like Icebreaker and understood the circular, understood the circular knitting process that it was completely different to the weaving process that the Italian weavers were doing, I travelled up to China, our teams travelled up to China, we worked with the top makers, they were saying to us, the stuff you're delivering us is too even, we've got too many even fibres, we actually need a variation in length. Um, so what can you do to, that to, to help us with it? We were able then to go back onto the farms, engage with the shearing contractors and the teams that were going in the shed and with the farmers, and then start customising the deliveries that were coming off farm. So on those fleeces that were going to icebreaker, we leave the backs and the necks and the pieces on. We just take off those sweaty tips around the outside of the fleece and maybe the bird's nest out of the top of the shoulder uh, and, the, and, the, and the rest of the fleece is customised and delivered to icebreaker. What that does is give us a better product out the other end so the top maker's happier because he's got a more variation in length that he, that's required. The farmer, instead of getting 35 or 40 per cent of the fleece going into his contract, is now getting 75, 85, 95 per cent of that fleece going into the contract and we're getting win-win situation. Also an opportunity to drop a, a, a shed hand in the shed in terms of, of numbers so there's a cost saving and, and things as well. So it's an opportunity for that supply chain to work together and find efficiencies throughout that supply chain. When we put this icebreaker supply chain together, we gathered together as a group in China and it was the first time that the supply chain had been sat down in the room together and opened up their books and worked through this uh, ever and that was only sort of about 10 years ago. So. It is quite revolutionary and it is quite changing, but the opportunity is there, and if we get it right, the value is in now the likes of icebreaker contracts are going, rolling out the three-year contracts, and as one year drops off, another year rolls on. So farmers can then go and go to their bank manager or, or make investments based on those contract prices uh, for their wool. They can also then start breeding and, and uh, working around productivity gains and, and basically growing as much wool as they possibly can for that contract, rather than worrying about the the fluctuations and the and the very uh, volatility in the in the commodity market. So as I said, it's really important for us, and, and uh, Dan talked about it in, in the in the in the other speech there, the importance of um, the environment, who we're connecting with, social responsibility, animal welfare, and these sort of areas. Um, and it's not someone else's um, responsibility. I talked about this with Russell in the other room. Russell, we used to sit back here, I think, and I'm, it's not just farmers, I'm talking about the industry as well, and not just, not just our industry, but we used to sit back and say, oh, someone else will be taking care of that and thinking that that job was being done, and it wasn't. Um, so it's our responsibility to understand that and it's our responsibility to, to be connecting and, and making those stories. So how do we do that? Um, when we first started with Merino, very much around heritage and provenance, that New Zealand story that Dan talked about. We live in a beautiful country, we've got an opportunity to use that in, in, in marketing, but again that's not enough and I'll, I'll elaborate on that shortly. With Merino it was the opportunity that it's hand touched by somebody, a wool class that touches that wool. The job that the Merino farmers do every day, they're passionate about it, they're growing this wool, they're out there and feeding out in the winter time or they're bringing down the stock and they're working 
very hard to raise those sheep to produce a, a fantastic product. That story really connects as opposed to a synthetic uh, fibre that is a drum of oil tipped into a machine and an engineer sits down at a computer and types in something and spits out a fibre at the other end. There's power in that story. Uh, the fibre quality and the fibre attributes that we can that we can talk about um, in differentiating our fibre, much like uh, Dan talked about with, with meat, and so much about the people and the stories, about your stories or the farmer's stories, the connection to the land, the passion that is on the land that we can take out to connect with consumers out in the marketplace, which again I'll elaborate a little bit more on um, shortly. The natural performance of wool, and I talked about that before um, and gave the example of the carpet um, stores here in New Zealand where you go and you'll be sold it or they'll try to convince you that you want to buy a, a synthetic carpet. All those attributes around wool that we've utilised in, uh, in the Merino game, I think that there's opportunities in strong wool as well. The fact that it won't burn. I was at uh, Biella in Italy the year before last working with a company called uh, Armadillo Merino. Armadillo Merino focuses on producing um, garments for people that put themselves in harm's way. So the um, uh, coast guards, uh, army personnel, firemen, things like that. The example he used, um, hopefully you finished your breakfast, but it was American soldiers that were fighting in Iraq, fighting in the Humvees. Underneath their battle armour, underneath their Kevlar battle armour, they were wearing Nike um, Under Armour, you know that Under Armour brand? And because it's so hot over there, they were wearing that underneath their battle armour. These guys were being hit by these uh, roadside bombs, catching fire. Obviously, the Under Armour caught fire because it's made out of oil. It melted to their bodies, and then they had photos showing us. And this is the sort of imagery that he was using to sell his products into the, the consumers that he's trying to target in this active um, harm's way, people, of soldiers having this... Um, fibre peeled off their skin and their skin coming off at the same time and the opportunity around wool wearing that next to your, next to your skin also around this health and wellness that I'll talk about uh, shortly as well um, as, as, we, as we go forward because there's a big opportunity around babies and, and infant wear and, and bedding and things like this around health and wellness that we see. So definitely around the natural performance of wool, basically these synthetic fibres, and I'm biased, I hope there's not too many uh, oil barons in the room, but I'm bloody biased, but um, man, all these synthetic companies that are going out and marketing these synthetic stories, all they're doing is copying what evolution has achieved over, over millions of years to produce this wonderful fibre called wool. We have so many opportunities <laughs> but we've dropped the ball in, tell in terms of telling those stories and connecting with our consumers. I really, really believe that. Um, and apart from a few uh, small areas um, uh, like, the, like the Merino area um, that we've been able to achieve. Animal welfare, we, we'd like to hide away from that. We'd like to pretend that it doesn't, that it's not an issue, but it's a big, big issue. We're attacked, you, you all know about the attacks. We're att uh, the, the wool industry's been attacked by Peter in Australia with the shearing industry. You probably would have seen that. Uh, an example was uh, a company called Ovis 21, South American wool supply company that was supplying Patagonia and the likes of uh, the Kering Group or um, uh, Stella McCartney, Paul McCartney's daughter, who's a fashion designer. Um, they were attacked by, by PETA. PETA went into these people's homes, these South American farmers, much like New Zealand farmers. Um, hospitality is just second to na none nature like us. They said, can we come and stay with you? They didn't know they were undercover for PETA. They said, yeah, welcome to our house. They fed them. They gave them wine, as the South Americans do. They treated them with respect. These guys were filming what they were doing on the farm. They went back then and then attacked um, Ovis 21, in, a, in particular Patagonia. Um, in, in social media. Uh, within 24 hours, Patagonia had severed all their ties with Ovis 21s in terms of their wool supply. Within 48 hours, uh, Stella McCartney had severed all her ties in terms of a wool supply arrangement with, with uh, um, the, the um, Ovis 21 South American supply group. Now really what they were doing on farm was not a lot different to what we were doing here in New Zealand, but I'm just pointing it out that it's something that we need to be really, really conscious of. We're positioned beautifully in New Zealand for what we do. We're the best farmers in the world. We have to tell that story, but we need to understand that story. And we need to understand how we tell that story and we need to understand how we handle these attacks when they come. Um, and we need to be thinking about that forward before it happens to us and then we're all scrambling about how we, how we deal with that. Because I don't believe that um, within industries that we're protected, like if it happens in the, uh, you know, foot and mouth outbreak happens, it's going to affect all of us. Or if the botulism, it doesn't just affect the dairy industry, I think by default it affects, affects all of us in this room in some way, shape or form. So that leads me on to this collaboration stuff that I'm going to talk about.
environmental sustainability that again that Dan talked about a real key point um, we were addressed by a guy called Simon Arnold who is a world leader on nation branding uh, he talked about New Zealand's position as a leader in, in the environmental sustainability not just sustainability these days as a catch cry but actually rejuvenation the world wants to see not just leaving it the way we found it but actually rejuvenating and making it into a better, better place particularly those Millennials that he talked about those people that were born after the year 2000, my children for example, Molly's uh, 12, Isaac's 10 and we've got twins that are, that are 8, um, they come home from school and they're talking about the environment, they're talking about how can we protect the environment, what are we doing mum and dad to protect our environment, these are the kids that in 5 or 10 years time are going to be buying our products, how do we connect with them both in New Zealand here and around the globe. And overall then arching is providing that trust and transparency, transparency and the audit trails um, to, to overarch all of this. And I think overarching everything is, is um, that transparency and trust in our business. Shifting away from the old model where I'm protecting what I'm doing and I really don't want you to know to a much more embracing culture that's sort of coming out of places like Palo Alto and San Francisco where it's much more engaging, much more open. How can we work together to make more money than screw each other to try and make a little bit of money that's falling off the table? Unashamedly, we're targeting this Lohars market and again, I'll, I'll default back to, to what Dan was talking about. Lohars stands for Lifestyles of Health and Sustainability. You see it everywhere and um, this particular woman here is the woman that we're targeting, not her, but I don't know about the men in the room, but if you think about the purchasing decisions that are made in our household, most of them are driven by women, even down to the clothes that we're wearing, and I guess that I'll set myself up there wearing a pink shirt to a group of farmers, and, and so I can blame my wife for that. But our, our wives and our women are making those purchasing decisions. They are conscious about where it's coming from, what impact it had on the environment, what impact it's going to have on me, and emotionally, how do I feel about making those purchases? Deliberately, we're trying to target them. We're not trying to target the whole world. We're trying to target those top 30 million um, affluent consumers at the top of the food chain there. That's who, we, that's, who we want to, that's who we want to target. Very much around health and wellness. Again, that was talked about before. People are conscious about their health and wellness now. It's, it's everywhere that we see. And we need to understand that space. You know, it was really interesting looking at that 51% of millennials now will pay more for something that's sustainable. They care about, about their environment. You know, 8.9% of the population, of the world's population in 2020 will be over, I think it's 65 years of age. How do we connect with those people? How is social media going to be important to our businesses as we go forward? The example that uh, the Stanford guys gave to us um, last week was businesses like Kodak, for example, 10 years ago or 15 years ago, Kodak were at the top of their game. You bought a Kodak camera, it was the best camera you could buy, you know? This young upstart came into them and said, oh, I've got this idea for digital cameras. They said, bugger off, we don't want to know about it, we're at the top of the game. Within 15 years, Kodak, they're gone. They've been swallowed up, digital media has just swallowed them up. The, the music industry that I'm involved in now, People don't want to pay for their music, it's streaming live. We can't sell records anymore, the game's changed. The media on TV that we see at the moment, Sky TV and what's happening there, people don't go and sit down and watch TV programs like they used to. We've got Netflix, we can watch whatever we want, when we want to watch it. Our kids are streaming stuff live in. You can watch live All Black games, you can watch whatever you want, when you want to watch it. The TV space has gone, so in terms of advertising, what, is that, what does that mean? What does that, that mean for us? as uh, producers here uh, in New Zealand. My technology is breaking down. Incident uh, interestingly, I think one of the key things that we want to point out, and, and it's the elephant in the room, I think you, you all know, there's no silver bullet, there's no, yes, New Zealand is pure, there's a story to tell there, but there's, we have to protect that and there's an opportunity to understand that and um, there's no silver bullet. The idea that like we used to have with even with Merino, being able to slap a picture of Mount Cook or some, uh, some beautiful Merino sheep grazing on the side of a mountain and hey, job's done, we've got the marketing job right, is gone. There's a whole level of sophistication that's required 
and understanding different markets. And that was to, again, to Dan's point, is understanding different markets and different ecosystems around the world want different things. So what's you know what some markets in China are looking for as, as affluence grows in China is different to how people are perceiving and seeing things in, in Denmark, for example, or in, in Europe, or even in the United States, how things are seen in, by people consuming things in New York are different to those in San Francisco. So it's understanding, understanding that and connecting with that. So at NZM, we've really gone about building a sophisticated team. Um, a, a, as Dan taught, we want to bring on new young people all the time that are not just have um, an agricultural degree, but may have anthropology or a degree in fine arts and things like that. And understanding that when we're con connecting with those consumers, we need a broad base for our, uh, for our education. Our sophisticated value approach includes obviously a marketing team, uh, second to none, a communication specialist, design and creative that are cre uh, creating the design and creative work for our brand partners, an environmental scientist that's on our team that's involved with uh, different organizations around the world, um, production science, a PhD qualified geneticist that's working on that production science work for our um, producing sheep for our brand par partners. The list goes on and on. All I'm saying is that the idea that we can say we want to move up value chains, we want to be connected in the market, we want to be doing all these things that like Dan's talking about and that I'm talking about, it requires a, a big level of sophistication to do that and a, and a level of investment. There's an opportunity around market segmentation like we've seen in, in, the, in the fine wool industry um, that, that instead of saying we want to just take merino wool to the world or we just want to take crossbred wool to the world, identifying segments within, within the market and opportunities around those segments. Uh, I've put this up here because we break it down into two kind of areas. That's uh, the blue ocean space and the red ocean space that the Stanford guys talk about. What the red ocean space is, those areas that people are already working in. So in the Merino case, it was, uh, in the case of uh, Merino when we started, it was the, like, the, the high fashion menswear preparing suits for the Italian weavers. All of our focus was on that at that stage. The reason why it's upside down, this was a marketing campaign we did with them uh, about 15 years ago with the Zelanda fabric going to Italy making suits. And it's interesting, um, it was, the story was that the wool came from the other side of the world, so the marketing campaign was in Europe and for the Italians. The other interesting thing I see in the advertising at this Italian stallion man standing there with a cigar in his hand. <laughs> Um, looking very dapper, and it was probably pretty pol politically correct th uh, these days for someone to be standing there with a with a cigar. If you skip on to the next one now, and we look at how that's evolved into a blue ocean space, 15 years down the track now, um, Smart Wall is a, is a key partner, as I said before. They didn't exist 15 years ago, so we're saying what are the opportunities um, for the likes of Strong Wall in an area that doesn't even exist now, where Smart Wall and Icebreaker and the active outdoors market are our biggest markets now. Um, the key markets like Italian weavers are still important to us, but those new um, evolving markets are, are very, very important. Um, and, and in strong wool space, and I'm talking about strong wool, I know you say it's a New Zealand Merino company, but we are uh, involved in strong wool now. We see synergies within our business in the strong wool uh, and opportunities around strong wool. We've been working in strong wool, crossbred wool for now for a couple of years, applying what we're doing there. So an example of that of the red ocean space there is, is in the carpet and interior textiles. We've just signed a, a contract you may have seen on TV on Saturday night, um, supplying wool to a high-end um, carpet manufacturer in Australia, differentiating through New Zealand, using New Zealand uh, wool and telling the story in that carpet space. Um, but opportunities, as we see, a shift away in Europe from carpets on the floor to more polished concrete and polished wooden floors to a blue ocean space opportunity likes of Glareups. Glareups are a Danish company that make indoor shoes, and we've got a supply contract with those guys as well, um, supplying wool into uh, the, making these shoes. So the, this Danish company sells about 500,000 pairs a year. They just We help them with um, a promotional video and some marketing work to sell in their concept to REI stores. REI is the biggest outdoor retail chain store in the US and we got that across the line, so um, Glareps are going to be sold in REI stores going forward. So the opportunity now is for them to absolutely go gangbusters, and our trouble will be finding enough wool to, su to supply their contract, which is absolutely fantastic. If you just click on to one more, and I'll, um, I'll leave it there. We've, uh, as I said, we've moved into the strong wool space. We're really excited about that, um, and I'm heading up that business here in the North Island. That strong wool space has been bought, built on, on four pillars, crossing the chasm or applying our fine wool model to the strong wool space. Very much about um, primary sector extension of how we can work together and collaborate. We're all trying to target that same consumer, the meat industry, the fish industry, the, the milk industry, the wool industry. How can we apply our, our, our nows together and work together and collaborate together to do some insight work to understand and get some empathy from those customers back here uh, to New Zealand? And if you flick through um, one more or two more. 
Um, keep going, mate. <coughs> We've been working up at Stanford, the fallout of that from the Stanford uh, group, if you click forward again, please. Um, and one more. I'll just leave you with this team you were saying, this idea around collaboration. I don't just mean um, outside of the wool industry. I think there's an opportunity. We need to work together and collaborate within our industries, within the, the, the different uh, wool companies that are out there. Uh, cutting each other's throats not going to work anymore. Team USA, for example, those brands on the left together, we've pulled them together. We're doing a collaborative um, program um, up in the United States where all of those companies are putting money in. We've leveraged money out of the government and doing a, a very, very expensive but validating um, insight program work in the USA market, much to your point that you asked, we see the US as a huge opportunity for us and for our products, and we're doing some insight work in the USA through that, through that Team USA. So look, I've uh, sort of rushed through the end of it, but thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to come up and talk to you today. I, I think it's absolutely fantastic that this group's together, and uh, I, by all means, I'd love to answer some questions, and I'll be around for the rest of the day. Thanks very much. That's, that's great. Thank you very much, Craig. Um, grab a seat. But look, I'd like to open the floor for maybe one or two quick questions. So do we have any of this? There's one over here, and I'll run because our time is short. What micron wool is used in the glare-ups? The question is what micron wool is used in the glare-ups? Uh, it's a 29 micron average, so we take down to sort of about 26 and through to about 33. But that's okay. Lambs wool. Crossbred lambs wool. And then, as Craig said, he's, um, his new role is working in the North Island with a bunch of stuff there. So we're in the North Island here, so that's probably quite a relevant question. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All right. Hey, that's tremendous. Look, and just one little thing to share with you. Um, seeing those brands up there, and um, a few months ago I actually got married, and I had a very, very nice suit, and on the inside was um, was, was Rita, was, was the brand. And... Um, I married a South Island High Country girl and we got married at Wanaka and um, so that was actually a very, very fitting brand and she was able to tell me a little bit of the backstory about that. So, so a bit like um, what we heard from Dan, we've got to dine with indulgent consumers and learn about them, you know, we also got to learn a bit about those fantastic brands that, um, that our produce goes into. So, um, so thank you, thank you very much for that Craig. Thanks very much. Uh, please thank Craig again.